Hey guys, it is Patrick. Before you get started with understanding debits and credits as well as how to do journal entries, I wanted you to know that if you go to my website at www.patrickleemsa.com, you're gonna find links to all eight lessons in this series. So if you get turned around or you don't know what the next lesson is or how to get to there, you can definitely go to my website, click on the next lesson, and it'll take you right back here to YouTube where you can view the entire lesson. Also, in the description section below, I've put a link to where you can purchase the notes for this series so that you can just sit back, learn more about debits and credits and doing your journal entries and you've got the notes right in front of you to follow along. So if you head to my website at www.patrickleemsa.com to purchase those notes as well as see all the links for this next eight lessons in this Understanding Debits and Credits and Journal Entry series. Until then, let's get going with your lesson. All right, in this series, we're gonna help you understand debits and credits, as well as help you understand how we as accountants do journal entries and the relationship between both the debits and credits, as well as journal entries. Now, the importance of all of this is because as accountants, we take economic events or transactions that the company does on a daily basis, and we need to have some way to be able to take that data, put it into the accounting information system, and produce information that is useful to decision makers in the organization. And the way that we do that is we do it through this system of journal entries and debits and credits, and that is the language that we kind of use so that everything is organized organized within our accounting information system. So that's what these next eight lessons is all about, is helping you understand kind of at the very start what things make up debits and credits and how those debits and credits um, translate to journal entry. So that's what we're gonna be doing in this series. In this lesson specifically, we're gonna help you understand the different components in accounting. It's kind of that first layer of understanding uh, that we're gonna build upon as we get closer to talking about debits and credits. So let's take a look here at components in accounting. So in accounting, we need to start with an understanding of the six main components we use for classifying transactions. So the way that I like to think about it is we've got six buckets that we're trying to organize all transactions into, and the only way we can organize them is into one of six buckets. Now, every economic event that occurs in the business can be categorized into one of these six components. The first one being assets, the second one being liabilities, then we have owner's equity, we have expenses, then revenues, and then dividends. So those are our six main components in accounting. So just like I said, we have these six buckets. If we got any type of transaction that we need that actually affects the basic accounting equation, which means that we actually have to book it into the accounting information systems, we have to pick between one or two or maybe all of them, which buckets we're gonna classify that transaction. And you're gonna learn a little bit later that a transaction usually is gonna hit two buckets, two different buckets at the same time. Sometimes it hits just one bucket, but we have to classify that transaction into one of these six buckets. So that's why it's so important to understand what these buckets are, and we're gonna understand what these buckets mean here in a moment. So those are our six main components. Let's talk about each one of these buckets so that you understand the terminology from an accounting standpoint. So the first one here is assets. These are resources that a company owns or controls that a company is expected to reasonably obtain some type of future financial benefits from. Example of assets are cash, equipment, and inventory. Cash, if we think about cash being an asset, what we mean by that is cash is something that's a resource that a company has and we would expect that a, a company is going to deploy that cash in a manner to be able to provide future financial benefits to the organization. So whether that means that they're going to use that cash to buy a piece of equipment, use that cash to be able to acquire a piece of property, whatever they're doing with that cash is going to help them acquire something or do something to provide a future financial benefit to the organization 
organization. Now we just said that, you know, companies will take cash to buy equipment. We've got equipment here. Let's talk a little bit about equipment. Equipment, a company that manufactures things, what do they do? They have these pieces of equipment that converts a raw material into finished good. That finished good is then sold to an end user, to a customer for money. That money is that future financial benefit. So when we think about, you know, what things are assets, it's basically anything that a company owns or controls that is expected to provide some reasonable future financial benefits to the company. Now, the next one is a little bit easier to understand. It is liabilities. These are obligations that a company owes to an external party. Examples of obligations would be accounts payable, notes payable, salaries and wages payable. Um, really anything that has payable at the end of its name is usually a liability. Now, if we were to bring it down to like um, an example, a real life example that me and you might see liabilities, it's debt, right? So if we have debt, that is a liability. It's something that we owe to someone else. For us, it might be a bank, it might be a credit card company. For a business, it might, might be a customer, it might be a vendor, it might be a bank, it might be another company. There are so many different parties, external parties that a company might owe um, have some obligation with. Now, I want to be careful not to say cash because there are instances where we owe some type of obligation to someone, but it might not be cash. An example might be that a customer prepays for a service you're going to provide in, in terms of a deposit. So they give you a deposit and you promise to provide them a service. So if you don't provide that service, you have to give that money back. So you have an obligation to that customer to do something. How do you satisfy that obligation? Well, in this case, it's not about satisfying the obligation by paying cash. It is about providing the service. So there are times when there is an obligation and the way that we get rid of that obligation is not cash based but it is providing a service or delivering a product to that customer. So we wanna be careful by saying, oh, it's how much money I owe to someone else. It can be situations where it's not money, but a service or a product. The next one we have is owner's capital. Owner's capital is an owner's investment in the company. It is a direct investment in the company by an owner. Typically what happens is the owner has cash. They're willing to give that cash to the corporation or to the business to basically own a part of that company. So in exchange, often for public companies, they get shares. So if I buy, let's say, Apple stock, I am giving money in exchange for Apple stock, okay? So that would be a direct ownership or investment in the company. Now, it can also be any owner's claim to the company's resources. And that gets a little complex, but what I wanna break it down to you when we talk about this is that, you know, let's assume that a company has a million dollars of assets, okay? and they have $250,000 in liabilities. Meaning that if the company were to cease today, they have a million dollar of an asset, a million dollar of assets. If they would have to pay their liabilities first, they pay all of their liabilities, then they have $750,000 left. Now let's say the owners have contributed $400,000 to the company. So investors have contributed $400,000 to the company. So in a sense, we could refund their investment. So we've got 750,000. We can refund 400,000 of that 750,000 back to the owners for their investment. And then what's left? What's left is $350,000. That $350,000 of the $1 million, it can, is considered owner's claim to the company's resources, the excess of the company's resources. Now you might go, why would the company have extra resources? Well, the reason why may be that the company did not distribute all of the earnings to their investors because they wanted to reinvest in the company. And by reinvesting in the company, it hopes to make more money for the shareholders. And so uh, there, that might be a good reason why uh, there is still this owner's 
claim left to the company. Other situations might be that um, a company owns a building and that building has appreciated in value, but you can't take the value out and give it to your shareholders because you would have to liquidate that asset. And so instead you just keep it. And then if you were to terminate the business, you're gonna have all this extra cash. So that would be owner's claim to company's resources. Now from a fundamental level, owner's capital means owner's investment in the company, usually direct investment of into the company. All right, our next component is revenue. This is the sale of products or services in the normal course of business, represents the amount earned regardless if cash is received or not. So typically in accounting, we use something called the accrual method. The accrual method means that we book revenues when we earn them, we book expenses when we incur them. We don't care when we receive the cash and we don't care if when we pay the cash. So when we talk about this definition here of revenues, the revenues would be I've earned something even though I might not have been, I haven't been paid for it yet. But anyways, so selling products or service would be considered a revenue. Now, when we talk about revenues from the standpoint of how much money are we going to book or what what amount of revenues we're going to book we're going to book how much we have earned based on the services of the product we provide so for right now i'm technically earning a salary and even though i don't get paid today i have earned a salary i've earned revenues in my own personal budget so uh, we report the revenues when we earn them not necessarily when we get paid i get paid at the end of the month that's when i can take that money and use it, but I've already booked the revenue. When did I book it? I booked it when I earned it, not when I received the cash. Examples of uh, revenues are sales, sales revenues, and service revenues. Now related to revenues is expenses. So these are costs necessary to earn revenues in the ordinary course of business. This represents amounts incurred regardless if cash has been paid or not. Examples of this would be cost of goods sold and office expenses. So expenses, you know, when we think about revenue generating uh, activities, in order to generate revenue, we have to have expenses, right? Um, really, well, I would say that the government's the only one that doesn't have expenses, but uh, they, in order to generate tax revenue, they got to incur expenses. So really, any business out there, in order to generate revenue, has to have some type of expenses, whether it's personnel, whether it's goods, whether it's utilities, whether it's a building, whether it's equipment, there's some type of expenses that need to be uh, had in order to generate the revenue. That's what this is. So any cost incurred to generate the revenue, and they don't have to be direct costs, they can be indirect costs. Indirect for instance, like the CEO. The CEO is not really involved in the sale of the goods, but they are an integral, indirect cost of running that business. So that would be expenses. Last one here is dividends. You probably won't see this often. You know, in the normal course of transaction analysis, you might only see this at the very end of the year or maybe four times a year. Most companies pay dividends once every quarter, but dividends are distribution of profits to shareholders, owners, and investments. Really, we just have one account and it's called dividends. Dividends are not an expense. That's the misconception that a lot of students have is that uh, dividends is an expense. It's not an expense. All this is, is that the company has a profit at the end of the year. And obviously as an investor, let's say I'm the investor, as an investor, I'm investing in this company so that if they make a profit, I can share in a little bit of that profit, right? Um, you know, we don't invest to not make money. We as investors are investing to make money ourselves. And so one way we can make money is through the dividends, the distribution of profits. And so when a company's board of directors decides, hey, we've got $50,000 of profits, we need to keep 30,000 in the business to be able to keep running it but we can probably spare $20,000 and give those to our investors, that is called the dividend. So the board of directors would approve a $20,000 dividend, and then that would be distributed to all of the shareholders based on their ownership uh, in the company, ownership percentage in the company. So that is a dividend. It is not an expense. And the reason why it's not an expense is it doesn't have to be paid. There are some very profitable companies that do not pay any dividends to their shareholder whatsoever. 
Why? Because those companies believe that they can reinvest it and get a better return than if they gave it to their shareholders and have them deal with it or them try to reinvest it themselves. And so that logic of, hey, we're just going to reinvest ourselves will hopefully grow that shareholder's worth of that company's stock. So dividends, distribution of profits to shareholders, owners, or investors. So that is a look at the components in accounting. Just understand that there are six components, six buckets. If we have transactions, we need to classify them into one of six buckets at the end of the day. Now there is a problem with just having six buckets and we'll cover that in the next lesson when we talk about accounts. So hope you enjoyed this lesson and we'll see you in the next video. Hey guys, thanks for watching this lesson. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking over here. And for more accounting content, make sure you head to my website at www.patrickleemsa.com or clicking over there. And for the next lesson, just click right over here. Until next time, we'll see you in the next video.